color rush with my colonoscopy because it's personally going to cost me 5,000 rand. So I'm actually going to go to the gastroenterologist at Kingsbury in his rooms, um, which is in room endoscopy that's actually going to be covered by, by, the, um, by the medical aid. Um, the other important thing is that when you want to try and maximize your bill, and it's, it's, we are so scared to talk about money, at the end of the day we have to make money, that's just the, the reality of life. Um, when, you, when you're doing endoscopy and theater, but the, first of all, when you start billing, it's important to understand that no one really bills at base rate anymore. So medical aid comes in at 100% medical aid, and not many people bill at base rate. A lot of the doctors are contracted in at different levels, which is base plus. So Discover has a couple of different contracts. But if you actually look at the 100% medical aid, Discovery medical aid rates for gastroscopy, it's about 870 rand. If you have a look at a colonoscopy, it's about 1,600 rand. So that's that's sort of a 30 minute slot for gastroscopy and colonoscopy, an hour slot, let's say, if that's what you do. And that's the fee that you can bill when it's done in theatre. The difference then is that you start shifting and you start thinking, well, how can I maximize this? And there's, new, there's, there's more codes that you can use when you are doing procedures out of hospital, when you're doing procedures out of hospital with your own equipment. And quite quickly, when you start using different codes, you can take that gastroscopy fee of 870 and you can almost double it at 100% base rate by looking at um, charging for performing it with your own equipment and discovering procedures performed in your own rooms and using your own monitoring equipment, which can only be more ones. And then the same sort of applies for your colonoscopy. So your colonoscopy, you know, by building those codes because you're doing them in rooms, is obviously you're going to increase as well. So that's more that you can build. Although you think that you, the patients pay you more money, what ends up happening is that they don't have a co-payment fee that they have to be then paid to the hospital, and then the medical aid doesn't get smashed with that sort of a 200 grand per, um, per minute or while they're in theater. So although it does work for medical aid, it does actually become more affordable for the patient. So once you decide that you want to make the move, and, and I think this is important because you have to understand where you work at, and this is the luck factor, you have to utilize what they've got and you have to decide how you're going to optimize it for your benefit. And the most important thing, and this is probably where I was quite lucky, is that I, I really befriended the hospital manager. And um, Kingsbury didn't have an endoscopy unit. Some hospitals do, um, but Kingsbury didn't. And um, what I ended up actually sitting down with them with the hospital manager was, you know, I sat down with them and I said, listen, you know, there's a potential that I can double my income. Personally, I can double my income without having to work any harder. Um, so hands and knees, you know, please support me in this. And they were actually very supportive of it. They also then turned around and said, okay, but we're gonna lose revenue. And the issue is that they're actually not going to lose revenue because by setting up a co-payment system, they, they block a theater list by letting me do aid code and They get a small portion. Um, whereby they can actually open up the theater list to an orthopedic surgeon who they can build 220 rand a minute. So indirectly, they end up making more money. The other third argument or discussion point that we had is that by me doing endoscopy in rooms on site at Kingsbury, we could still put the Kingsbury stamp on it, which is great. Um, and we could also then make sure that we weren't losing patients to other doctors at other hospitals because <coughs> both payments couldn't be paid or medical aids would deny that work being done at Kingsbury. And then if that happens, you end up losing the downstream pathology. So the cancer that I should have been finding that goes to my colorectal surgeon who operates in theatre and the patient stays in hospital for a week um, doesn't go to another gastroenterologist, his colorectal surgeon, at Ned Care down the road. So, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of discussion points to be had with, um, with your hospital management to support you and your endeavor of optimizing your billing with the same advisor that they are not losing money, but they are making, they are making profits based on indirect costing. And you can actually, if you've got a good enough relationship, you can have that discussion with them. The second thing is that you have to find like-minded colleagues. And when I say like-minded, you have to actually find people that also know how to scope um, and do endoscopy. So, so I, I was fortunate I had, I've got two colleagues. Um, one was actually a breast surgeon, his name's Aaron Andrini, who actually worked in colorectal, and I think he even trained a couple of the guys in this, in this, um, in, in this forum. 
I um, mean, Aaron's really good with the scope, I think. So I watched him scope a bit and he helped me a little bit as well. So I managed to actually motivate with Aaron, listen, let's put this together. You can double your profits without actually working any harder. And I promise you, I'll build an endoscopy unit that's better than the theater. Not, not too hard to sell. I managed to do that to a third colleague of mine as well. And that was very important because it meant that there were three colleagues who I knew would sort of uphold the image of the endoscopy center. We would all be able to work well together. I would benefit them by making them a little bit more money, which is great. And, um, yeah, and they, would, they would help me pay off the equipment by driving volume through the business. And, and that's quite important. I have done the numbers. You can do it by yourself. But obviously, if you, if you can get colleagues to come with you, numbers through endoscopy equipment pays the bills. Um, and ultimately, that, that, that is what you want to happen. Okay. So, so once, you, once you've got hospital management on board, once you've got your colleagues to come with you, then you have to find the right space. And bizarrely, COVID was the perfect platform for us to find the right space because the hospital, the, the Department of Health basically gave hospitals a complete blanket of sort of um, leniency when it came to getting procedures where and when and shuffling services around. So when that whole COVID sort of, um, uh, um, when COVID happened, we got a sort of an open um, access to any service in the hospital and, and lots of things were moved around and ICs were built in places that they shouldn't. And then eventually the hospital manager came to me and said, this is our time. If you want to start your endoscopy unit, I will give you a, a ward. And that's exactly how we started. We started with a drywall and a ward and we kind of built a wall around the space. And we kind of used this diagram to sort of work out flow. You obviously need a waiting area, a welcome area, you need a changing room, you need a procedural area, you can use a sluice room in the ward if you can design it that way. Trying to keep things clean and, and wet areas or dirty and um, clean areas. And that was fantastic because it gave us the, the platform to actually start this. The hospital was quite stringent with regards to us starting. They wanted to know all the patients, all the patients that were coming through the service, and then they wanted to know outcomes, they wanted to know complications. And I think that was very good practice because it meant that you ended up having to keep um, specific light books. Um, and yeah, and we set up the service and the service kind of thrived. And sort of two years later, we still, um, we still managed to work in this facility. It was in the bounds of the Kingsbury Hospital, but it was completely run and sort of managed by us. And Kingsbury just had a stick on the door and that was pretty much it. This is something that's, that actually um, concerned me quite a lot and then kind of look around who's doing endoscopy in rooms and you realize that Kingsbury there's about four or five different other doctors that are doing endoscopy in rooms and then you look around the rest of, West of, the rest of Cape Town and all my colleagues and a lot of them do them in rooms so you think well actually legislation isn't that important and there's enough um, sort of leniency to say well you can just scope in your rooms and it shouldn't be a problem. However it is actually a problem and the Department of Health has actually made this quite clear so I think it's important just to state that if you are practicing out of the Western Cape, the rules are slightly different. The Western Cape has had sort of a gazetted um, um, change in the laws slightly where they can manage their own sort of structures. But all the provinces out of the Western Cape, as far as I can see, require a license to practice um, sedation-related endoscopy procedures. Um, and it is and it is essential that if you're going to embark on this process, I think you should talk to your DH um, representative and start this and get them involved, uh, you know, from the outset. Having said that, the Western Cape is slightly different, and the Western Cape is slightly different by that last point. This gazetted change says a license is not required in certain specified instances, including consulting room surgery, without any bed accommodation. And this is where a lot of the practices in the Western Cape have seen the loophole. And they're trying to, um, they're trying to kind of extrapolate, well, what is bed accommodation? So if I do a, if I do a scope in a, on, on a tray, well, it's a tray with wheels, it's not a bed, okay? That's what they're saying. Then you say, well, I sedate the patients, and as soon as they wake up, I get them up and I put them into a chair and I give them rusks and cookies and stuff, so they're not recovering fully in the bed. And that is the gray area that, um, that a lot of the doctors in the Western Cape are, are sort of using as a loophole. And this applies to a lot of people, plastic surgeons removing molds or doing procedures in rooms. Um, GPs doing basic procedures as well. 
Um, the problem is that when you actually talk to the departmental health about this, you obviously want to talk to them without sort of sticking your foot in it. But um, their understanding is that, that really it should still be done under a DOH, um, DOH license. Um, and ultimately, you as an endoscopist need to sleep all at night, knowing that if you, have a, if you have a complication in your room and the patient comes after you, is your MPS or your, your medical protection going to protect you knowing that you do not have a license? Um, and it just doesn't sit well with me. So my advice actually is to, if you're going to embark on this, you have to approach the, DA, the, DA, the Department for Health and you should be incorporating them from the beginning to help you build that license as your practice sort of grows. I actually asked Dion whether he knew whether there were any, um, any sort of um, guidelines that were on the SAGES website. Um, so I went into the SAGES website and I didn't think that there were, but there are a few guidelines that talk about safety in endoscopy, which I think should be looked at, um, endoscopy guidelines. The one thing is that they still have the Twitter sign in the corner, which kind of, I think, alludes to how well up-to-date those guidelines are as well, since Twitter is now X. Um, and if you actually open those, then there's a 2009 article by Dr. Krobler, and there's a, a presentation that's been kind of photographed onto it by Chris Mulder. So I'm not, I'm not sure how um, South African specific that is. But I think that's worth reading because nothing's really changed in sort of, um, in sort of in terms of sort of setting up these structures. The important thing is obviously equipment and costume, and you have to be a little bit savvy when it comes to this. I can't sit back and say, you know, all equipment costs the same because it really doesn't. <clears throat> so what I ended up doing is that I ended up from Krutus I was quite friendly with a lot of the reps. So I ended up phoning the reps and I tiered it up so that I had Pentax first, then I had Fusion on second, and then I had Olympus third. And I asked them to give us the longest demo that they could. And what ended up happening is that they gave us their one month or six week demo, which is fantastic. And during that sort of four or five month period, um, they demoed their equipment and they really, they really, they do a fantastic job, these, these guys. They bring their best equipment and they're really there to show it off. The nice thing about that is that they actually bring their rep there to help processing, which means that if you have any um, young endoscopic nurses, they also get some upskilling with regards to how to process equipment. During this time, you can practice with the flow of your, of your, of your unit, but most importantly, you also aren't paying costs with this equipment at that stage. Um, so you can start building up your reserves to put down a deposit um, when you eventually decide which equipment you're going to get. Um, so I eventually got an Olympus X1 because I liked it and I trained in Olympus. Um, and then I also got an Olympus Energy System, which I'm really, really happy with. Um, and um, we also managed to work into the deal that we could get Scope Guide. So we've got quite a nice system at the moment um, that we work with. The consumables are run on two different um, sort of um, parameters. Either you can buy your consumables or you can have consignment stock. Buying consumables is great because there's a little markup that comes with it. Um, medical aid will pay X amount for a snare, you will pay a buy amount and there's a little markup and if you purchase it, you can increase your, your profit in that. But the reality is that it actually becomes quite expensive and to end up having sort of 100,000 rand worth of stock in your cupboard, I think it becomes a little bit of a liability. So what happens is that we've got a nice from the Boston consignment, I've actually had consignment from, <coughs> from First Medical in a lot of different places and I've just settled with Boston because I know the guys. Um, I like the product as well. Um, I've also got some snares that I think are better. So I've got Debbie's snare on consignment for when I do an EMR. And you can start to pick and choose what consumables you want. And the nice thing is that you use it, then you pay for it. And again, if you want more profit, you can go buy it yourself. It's not an issue with us. So, so we just pay for what we use with Boston. And we've got a really nice consumables cupboard. The three endoscopists each have their own cupboard um, in our setup so that they can um, individualize what they like. Now, Aaron doesn't like the cold caps near from Boston, the 10 millimeters, so he's got something slightly different. And this is quite nice because it means that when you want something, you're comfortable with it and you can use it. Our monitoring equipment is, is quite standard and straightforward. Our hospital was fantastic because they allowed me to loot their sort of overflow machinery um, uh, stock room downstairs. So I managed to get a couple of things that, um, that are that is um, quite suitable for the unit um, without having to pay for it. But don't don't kid yourself, monitors are very expensive and your nephritists want the ones that beep and the ones that make noise and all of this sort of stuff. So 
it's just maybe quite important to bring them on board there as well. And then quite a difficult thing to organize is resuscitation and recovery equipment. Um, if you are having a plan for a DOH, um, DOH license, there is really strict rules and regulations about the recess equipment. Um, so we've got a full crash cart, we've got a full recess station, um, we've got all the recess drugs, we've got nasal pharyngeal airways, we've got lots and lots of stuff. And that is quite a little bit of money to actually put together, but um, I think it's absolutely imperative and you can't take shortcuts on that. These women or men will absolutely change um, your experience of developing this unit. Um, I managed to, to get Anthea, I didn't approach her from Kritiskia, she had already resigned and then I approached her, um, and Sister Rose, and there's another person, Sister Sharon, and between them they've probably got 40 to 50 years experience in endoscopy, and they are paramount to the service. They're paramount to flow, they're paramount to patient care, to reprocessing, to looking after equipment, and also successful endoscopy as well. So it's really important at this stage now to make sure that you've got a good relationship with your staff for that one day when they aren't working at the facility that you're at, they need a job and you can get them into your service because no one trains endoscopy nurses like the public sector. They really are good. So this is the final product. So this is our endoscopy unit that we've put together. Um, we practice under a um, DRH license. Um, it's an old eye sort of hospital unattached unit. Um, that's on the Kingsbury Hospital premises. Um, that is our, so don't scope in the theater bit, I've got, um, I've got um, proper striker trolleys, which is quite nice. Patients then don't have to be moved in between our trolleys, so we can just move the trolley around. Um, we, all of us actually scope in a slightly different way across patients. I scope in the setup, the two surgeons scope slightly different to me. But I've designed it so that the nephritist is on the one side, um, the endoscopy services on the other side, and that's kind of how we, 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 we use it. This is just our stack, which is a straightforward with the stack, <coughs> with Skokite as well, and the energy system fits quite neatly and nicely onto that as well. One day I hope they design things without cables, because I find cables at the end of the van. Um, and um, this is the final product. I did make a video, I don't know if you can press play. Um, I don't know if I can press play. Ah, cool. Yeah, so this is, so this is from my consulting area, you walk directly and down the passageway, directly in front and around the corner is a sluice room on the left and then a patient changing station on the right with lockaway cupboards. Um, and then you walk over what technically is a sterile line, or it used to be, we obviously own it, this is on sterile procedures. The little kitchenette with Anthea making some coffee and tea. This is a pre-endoscopy um, um, section where the patient can sit and wait right to the scope. There's a little wash basin on the right, our desk is in the middle, so we kind of at the hub of everything. And then on the left is our recovery area, and then we walk into our um, endoscopy unit space. Those are scheduled six and seven cupboards lock away in front of us. Um, all the recess stuff on the left, and our stuff on the, I mean on the right, and our stuff on the left. Thanks very much, Colin. Maybe we could call up Shani Ellsbury. Um, and while we're waiting, I just want to leave you with a second important rule in private practice, and that's to be able to differentiate the difference between price and value. And if you think charging 500 grand uh, for a terminal iron biopsy is a value, go ahead and charge it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I 100% uh, agree. And um, it was, the question was alluded to really on there's a polypectomy code, so you will put a polypectomy. Um, it's a little bit gray in terms of how many polyps you can actually bill for, um, and, and there is no differentiation between the size of polyps. So you have to sleep easy at night knowing that if you took off. Um, took off two diminutive polyps on the sigmoid where you pull out a biopsy for so you can clip them off because they're one to two millimeters. Are you going to build for two polyps? Are you even going to build for a polyp? Um, you know, versus a 15 millimeter sessile lesion that's very flat and it took you 20 minutes. You know, can you build the same? And at the end of the day, you actually, you, you'll know when you wake up in the morning whether that's okay or not. Um, and I think that's important integrity to just maintain.
Thank you, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us for the best that we can. Thank you so much, Chris and Colin. And after all of that, let's talk about the things. I'm going to try and add as much value as we can, but try and keep it short and sweet. Um, I'm Charlie Morgan, this is um, Elsa Marie Ross, and we are specialised private bankers looking after medical professionals with the music. And I guess the purpose for today is really to try and highlight some of our key aspects of our client value proposition for our medical professionals. And we're going to run through that with you now. And in doing so, we're really hoping to illustrate that we are fully equipped to partner with you on a personal and a business level. So on the screen here, um, we're displaying some of our, um, I almost want to say asset types or groups that we can assist with financing. I'm going to quickly unpack most of them. I think at some point in your career, and most probably in your personal life, you're going to need help with one of these points. And they're going to be a very high touch point that you need help with. And we believe we are best to assist with this. So essentially from a property perspective, the first time then, uh, we can assist with property and business financing um, assets. And that, again, stretches to personal and business. Whether or not you're looking at buying a home or buying a practice, whether or not you're looking at wanting to maybe do takeover finance for that practice or that home, or if you're thinking of building that practice or that home from scratch, we can help with that. Um, to Colin's point, medical equipment and costing is very important, especially if you're going to go into private practice at some stage, and that's exactly why we have So we help with that medical equipment piece, we help finance it, we um, normally do, do it over five years, at a prime less rate, um, and again, there we look at where, where um, is the actual equipment coming from, is it one supplier, um, one supplier multiple suppliers, etc. And we help build a, a nice solution for you. It is um, the actual medical equipment itself will be set up as an installment sale, but not on the screen, but worth mentioning. We also finance vehicles as an installment sale, and that would be new and second hand vehicles that we also help with. And then going over into private practice always needs a little bit more capital that you normally plan for, and that's kitting out your practice to look nice, to be a warm, inviting, Sarah, I suppose, for, for yourself your staff as well as your, your patients. Um, Colin's point as well, IT and infrastructure is important, having the correct things that can make them work and make your space easier to work with. So from a furniture, um, from a furniture and IT perspective, we also can help with financing that infrastructure for you. And lastly, most recently, but definitely very applicable at the moment, is backup solar and water. So we also finance sustainable solutions when it comes to your solar and water needs, and that would be for your home and your practice. Right, so that's me. I'm going to hand over my colleague, Elsa Marie, she's going to chat about practice management. Thank you so much, Shani. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elsa Marie. I just want to, a little bit shorter than Shani. Thank you. So practice management. Like Colin said, uh, staffing is paramount. So we, we can definitely assist with your practice management. We have options of a private bank account as well as a business account. Our private bank account, as you can see, has a competitive debit rate, 45 interest-free days on account purchases. And because Investec, you drive around, you don't see an Investec ATM, you have unlimited and free ATM withdrawals from any other bank. So we have partnered with the other banks if you needed to draw cash. And then very important, obviously, we have airport lounge access for all of your conferences that you do abroad. Um, then regarding your business account, um, we have one card, so it works as a debit and a credit card. So if you require a credit limit, we can definitely assist with that in order for you to either have a credit limit on your private bank account or your business bank account. Regarding the business bank account, we for example, you have a practice manager and you need someone to have access to maybe just download statements, making sure your um, tax is on, on point. We can definitely give someone capabilities if you wish to do so in order to access your business accounts and draw statements. We also partner, partner with an external partner called Mobile Theatre, where they assist if you need your medical aid payments to be registered. Okay, so how do we work and how do we partner with you? 
At Investic, we believe in a one-place philosophy, which basically means that Shani and myself, we are external bankers, we go out to see clients, we prepare your credit applications, but we partner with our colleagues, Shanel and, Sha and um, Elaine, that's based in the office, who assist with all of our admin-related queries. So whether you need, like Shani said earlier, um, assistance with your house, your car, medical equipment, we're one call away. If, however, you do need assistance after hours, we have a world-class client support center that's available 24-7, 365 days of the year, who you can call if you have problems with anything regarding, um, like it's digital issues. <laughs> Apologies, my battery just died. But um, if you have any issues with your online banking, you can just call our client support center. It's a warm body on the other side of the line, and they will be able to assist you. Um, then, lastly, we just wanted to say that if you wanted to talk to us afterwards, please come and grab a free Zebi. We're there to um, help in any way we can. Otherwise, um, we also have a QR code which we will send you if you wanted to go onto our website in order to get any further.
you, you, you know, you might want to take advantage of it. You might not, however, be in that area. You might be in a less affluent area where the patients can't get out of your pocket. You're not going to survive by, by not, not doing, you know. Questions to Colin as far as... Colin, one of the is salaries. I mean, salaries are a nightmare. They kill rent and salaries. I grew up in the shops, so you see. Um, so tell us, salaries... In the so I, I try my best to stay away from contracted salaries. Um, and the, the endoscopy team that works for us um, works on, I suppose you could call it, call it sort of a casual contracted salary. And it's a pay per hour. Um, and you pay a little bit more for their service per hour. And sort of every two weeks or four weeks they invoice us for their service. Um, but what's really nice about that is that. Um, yeah, is that, that you as an employee don't have these struggles of sort of sick leave and, and, and if you find the right people, it works really nicely. And, and we've managed to find the right endoscopy staff that, that it works well for. And that's actually how they set it up. It wasn't even how I proposed it. And they wanted a certain amount per hour. Um, if you had four cases on the list and you were and only there for, for a couple of hours, it's great, everyone goes up early. Um, but if you worked the whole day and you worked until the evening, they got paid more. So um, I thought that was quite a nice way to set it up. Um, so that would probably be something I would encourage. Um, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to say something about quotas and stuff. And I struggled a lot with it because you have to hunt for um, procedural codes and modifiers and all of those sort of things. It's not easy, it's, I mean, it's transparent, it's out there, but it's not easy to, it's not easy for the first couple of months and even years, you, you are struggling to decide, you know, am I putting the right codes, is this done, what else can I add, you know, the patient's BMI is above 35, I can add a modifier to this, um, the patient's on discovery, but the patient's, um, you know, other patients on finding tests, do they pay the same um, double or triple or four codes? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuances um, sort of around this, and that's that's probably where you know reach out to me or the guys that are doing some of the private work as well from the outset because you don't want to be missing those codes for the first year of your practice because that is money that is potentially owed to you. I mean, uh, you know, it's not you're not fraud, uh, you're not like like stealing anything from anyone. It's it's what the medical aids have budgeted um, to actually pay you. So you want to make sure that you're optimizing as early from the get-go as possible. Yeah, and I think the other important point is that you had a receptive hospital management group that encouraged you to do this. I've got some gastroenterologists in our hospital and in sister hospital who are thinking of doing this and the management are putting in obstacles. They're not happy with it because obviously they're going to, they're, you're going to lose the revenue. They're not, they're not endoscoping the theatres, they're endoscoping in a day ward kind of situation. So. Uh, you, you, your situation was a unique, it also was COVID, it, 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 it kind of came yeah, together not. very nicely at the right time. And as you say, you need a little bit of luck. But the important thing is not to force something that's not working and not going to something that's going to cost you and every month is going to cause burden on you because you know, you've got to pay these costs. It's going to be a very controlled um, situation where you're on top of it and where you look at all the small things, you know, because once you concentrate on small savings, the big things will fall into place. So beware of rushing into this and unless everything falls into place very really nicely. And you've got good bankers that are going to live and they're going to learn your money. Remember, there's always a payback. Can I just say one last thing? I think we're going to have time. I, I, I went to the business model for the
the way to go, and uh, you will all get to be involved with this, I'm sure, at some point in your career. So, any questions? Come on the floor. Questions to Vesnik. And Vesnik have got to stand as you've seen, and you're welcome to ask him. All right, well, thank you very much. Oh,